welcome to LSU Shreveport. Uh, we're so glad that you're with us. Uh, welcome to new, two new PA students and then our residents. Today I'm going to talk about pediatric GU radiology. It's to better recognize common pediatric GU conditions, to develop a differential diagnosis for certain findings, and to stimulate your continued learning and studying of pediatric GU conditions. If you see adrenal calcifications, you think there's a thing called neonatal adrenal hemorrhage. When these little babies are born, they're under some stress, the adrenal will he get hemorrhage. And on ultrasound, it'll get real echogenic, it'll get big, it'll lose its triangular shape. But as it starts to resolve, the hematoma resolves, it will return towards its normal triangular shape, which is kind of like the Star Trek emblem, and it'll calcify. So you'll see these tri this triangular calcification, as opposed to tumors, which I'm gonna talk mm -hmm. about in a second, they will keep a mass shape because they're a tumor, they're a mass. They're not going to return to the normal adrenal shape. So neonatal adrenal hemorrhage is one. Infections, if you have TB or histo or fulminant meningococcemia, you can get adrenal calcifications. Tumors such as neuroblastoma, pheochromocytoma, or even a dermoid can calcify. Addison's disease can get adrenal calcifications. And this is something for the boars you need to know. It's not very common, but it's called Wolman's disease. It's familial xanthomatosis. It's an autosomal recessive condition when the adrenal accumulates lipids. With, they get big livers, big spleens. They'll get punctate adrenal calcifications, and these patients will usually die within the first few months of life. This was an a, a IVP. With, it, we used to do intravenous polygrams. A better name was excretory urograms, because that's really what it is. It's excreting, and we're looking at the GU tract. This, we don't do these anymore, we do CTs, but you still could get this from a KUB performed after they had a CT scan. So you could still get this exact picture. And if you look there, here's the right kidney, here's the left kidney, these are the calyces, this is an infundibulum, this is the renal pelvis, this is the ureter, this is the bladder, but if you look right above the kidneys, the adrenal glands are suprarenal glands. And this was, on the scalp image, was this white, so this is not contrast enhanced. These are calcifications. This was a this kid had stress in uh, when the baby was born, and this is was neonatal adrenal hemorrhage. You see how it kept its triangular shape. That's the normal adrenal shape. As opposed to this person, if you look really close, there are amorphous type calcifications, quote in the liver, close quote, because everyone knows that's the the white is the liver, but this was not in the liver. It was the so you do this, you can do an ultrasound, but they do a CT. This looks like the kidney because there's the left kidney, but when we go down, you can see that there's the right kidney. This was the adrenal mass. This was neuroblastoma. Neuroblastoma, the, if, the, if you deliver a baby, if you, if you, everyone not delivered a baby yet, you grab, the, the, you control the delivery, the head comes out, then you stop, stop, the, you say don't push, no puhe, no puhe, or don't push, mm -hmm. you feel the neck. And you're feeling the neck for a cord. If there's an umbilical cord wrapped around the neck, you put it over. And you feel sometimes there could be two or three of them. It's called nuchal cord times one times two times three. Once that's fine, you pull the head down to get that, that shoulder out. You pull the head up, the other shoulder comes out, then you better catch them because now they're going to shoot out. And so let's say you deliver the baby, you cut, clamp the cord, cut the cord, put them under the chicken lamp, that the heater, and you felt the belly. And you say, there's a mass. If you, uh, you, we haven't done any radiologic study. We haven't ultrasound, we haven't CT, we haven't done anything X-ray. We just feel a mass. The differential, the number one, the most likely chance that that is, is hydronephrosis. Number two is multicystic dysplastic kidney. Number three is neuroblastoma. Neuroblastoma is the most common solid renal mass in a newborn. Newborn is 30 days or, or younger. Did you say number two? Multicystic dysplastic kidney. That's number two. Number one is hydronephrosis. Two is multicystic dysplastic kidney. Number three is neuroblastoma. Up to 70% of neuroblastomas will calcify. So on every newborn that you have, they can be born with it, up to 70% calcify. So you, I always look in the upper quadrants for any calcifications because it could be neuroblastoma. This was neuroblastoma. The big thing, Wilms tumor, the big differential, is it neuroblastoma or is it Wilms tumor? Wilms tumor is rare in an infant. An infant is less than one year. Wilms tumor is between one and eight years. Wilms tumor, classic for boards or steps. To a mom giving their two or three year old a bath, feel a belly mass. So after the age of one, Wilms tumor becomes the most common palpable mass. Because you would already found the, the you would have already found the hydronephrosis. You would have already found the multicystic plastic kidney. 
you would have already found the neuroblastoma, so now it's Wilms tumor. <clears throat> and in this case, you see this heterogeneous enhancing mass, kind of poorly enhancing, but here is clearly, there's a claw sign. This mass is clearly coming from this kidney. So you know this is a kidney mass. Neuroblastoma is usually an adrenal mass. The best prognosis for a neuroblastoma is if the kid is less than one year of age at the time of diagnosis and it's in the adrenal. You don't, remember, it could be anywhere in the sympathetic chain. The organ of Zucker candle. You remember the organ of Zucker candle? That's at the right below the takeoff of the IMA from the aorta. Yes, ma'am. Hi, Laura. Hi. So uh, it's in the it's in an adrenal. Wilms is usually in the kidney. We have had a strange case that the Wilms was actually in uh, in the bladder. So to differentiate the two, organ neuroblastoma is adrenal or sympathetic chain. Wilms is the kidney. The best prognosis for neuroblastoma is less than a year of age. Classic presentation of Wilms is two to three year old, but it can be one to eight. It's rare in an infant. Rare means it happens, but not often. 70% of neuroblastomas will calcify, only about 10% of Wilms will calcify. What does it do? The shape, these are usually stippled, and if there are any in Wilms, it's curvilinear. So that would not be a great one to differentiate. This will be bilateral and 10%. Wilms will be bilateral less than 10%. Oh, another name for Wilms tumor is nephroblastoma. Nephroblastoma is Wilms tumor. Wilms tumor is nephroblastoma. Midline, the neuroblastoma loves to cross the midline. Wilms may cross the midline. Something, what does it do to the renal vein and inferior vena cava? This is simple if you just think about it. Wilms tumor is a kidney tumor. So if it's in the kidney, it's going to invade the renal vein and grow into the renal vein. It can grow into the IVC. It can grow up into the right atrium. Wilm, uh, neuroblastoma is an adrenal tumor, which is super renal. So it's not, it shouldn't invade, but it will encase. It will go around and encase the renal vein and the IVC. <clears throat> you need to know where they love to go. Neuroblastoma's number one spot to metastasize to is the bone. Neuroblastoma loves the bone more than lymph nodes, more than liver, and lung is the least. Wilms tumor's favorite is lung, lung than liver. So it doesn't like the bone. Neuroblastoma loves the bone. Wilms loves the lung. Associated other neuroblastoma has congenital heart defects, egg ganglionosis of the bowel. Wilms, you have to know Wilms is associated with Beckwith Wiedemann. Those kids with a real big tongue, big liver, big spleen, uh, sporadic aniridia, sporadic aniridia, renal or genital anomalies, and hemihypertrophy. So beckwith Wiedemann can have hemihypertrophy, so can Wilms tumor, nephroblastoma. <coughs> Neuroblastoma, at 90, if you did this urine VMA level, 95% will have an elevated urine VMA. So they need to do, if they really suspect neuroblastoma, they need to order lab tests. If the, you have primary adrenal neuroblastoma that metastasizes to the skin, it's called blueberry muffin syndrome. Wager, Wager syndrome, you'll hear Wager syndrome. It's a rare genetic syndrome in which affected children are predisposed to Wilms tumor, aniridia, genital urinary anomalies, and mental retardation. So you will hear this. If uh, it results from a deletion on chromosome 11, uh, seniors, do they like to ask chromosome questions? So on the boards, they do ask chromosome questions. So Wager is a chromosome 11. Most cases are not inherited. And if they're obese, it's Wager, Wager and then O. The O is obesity. They can get pancreatitis and renal failure also. So if you have an absent kidney on IVP, we don't do IVPs anymore, but if we have an absent kidney, they, for some reason they had a CT, let's say CTA of their head to look for an aneurysm. And then they had belly pain or they put an NG tube down and they want to check. And they do, you do a KUB and you see one kidney and you don't see the other. What, is it, what could that possibly be? It could be congenitally absent. People are born with one kidney. It could be surgical. They've had a nephrectomy. Maybe they had a bad infection. Uh, they might have had XGPs, anthrogranulomas, pyelonephritis with a non-functioning kidney. They might have had multisystemic kidney. They might have had a tumor and they resected it. It could be from chronic reflux or scarring, chronic infection, and they scar down and they're, they're not functioning. They're not going to be excreting and they can atrophy and you won't even see it. It could be just be a non-functioning kidney like in uh, XGP, xanthogranulomas, pyelonephritis, which Proteus mirabilis is the bacteria usually. It's associated with a big staghorn calculus. You get Proteus behind it. It starts making all this fatty looking stuff. The kidney is like a pussed out, non-functioning kidney. It could be that it's ectopic. It could be in the pelvis. 
It could be cross fusectopia. It could be horseshoe kidney. It could be in the chest. So you've got to look to make sure that it's not somewhere else. In this case, you see this kidney right here? This is a pelvic kidney. This is the normal side. The ureter goes way up to where it should be. But do you see the kidneys form in the pelvis? And then they follow the psoas muscle and they go to where they should. This is a pelvic kidney. Do you see that the ureter is just as normal length? It's, it's as long as it needs to be for that pelvic kidney. It's not like it's a whole bunch extra that would fit in the renal fossa. This kidney was, when this kidney was migrating, the ureter was forming, it stopped right there. And that ureter is as long as it needs to be. So this is a pelvic kidney. You can see pelvic kidneys are increased risk of getting trauma because this is right over, if, I, if this was a thin person, thank God for my fat, it protects me a lot. And that's what I like to think of. But no, I really, that's not good. But if this is a thin person and I punched him or kicked him or her, the, my foot or my fist could go between the skin, between this kidney and the spine, the sacrum, and can cause trauma. And so it's, it's a bad place to be, but that's a pelvic kidney. This is actually in the chest. This probably had a morgagni hernia because there's hepatic flexure up in the chest also. But this, this is the heart. This is, oh, for the students, this tumor you're going to see in everybody. Don't take it out. Patients do horrible when you take that big tumor out of the chest. So uh, this is an intrathoracic kidney, and the ureter is as long as it needs to be because when this thing go, it was going crazy. It just kept going up and up and up. Here is a cross fusectopia. This is one kidney. You can see the calyces are, look like cups. These are, the, in, these are the fornices. These are the fornices. The wall of the cup are the fornices. This part is the infundibulum. And this is the renal pelvis. And here's the other kidney. These are cross fusectopia. The most common cross fusectopia is when the left kidney is fused with the right kidney on the right side, not the right kidney on the left side. This is the most common. The left kidney is ectopic on the right. It's usually fused with the lower pole. And the important thing to know about this is the abnormal left kidney that's on the right, its ureter will insert normally. It will cross back over and insert right where it should. So the, this ectopic left kidney that's fused with the right kidney, the ureter will go back to where it should be at, it, at its UVJ. So that's important to know. Here's an ultrasound of it showing that there's, it looks like, you, just as one image, you don't know if that's cross ectopia, that's a horseshoe kidney. But this was uh, cross fusectopia. They did a CT for some other reason. You can see one renal pelvis here. You see one here, one here. We have two different kidneys. We have two ureters. This is cross fusectopia. And this ureter will, if you go down lower, will cross the midline and go back to where it should in the bladder. Here is, uh, this is the renal shadow. This is a renal shadow. These calyces, if you look, the axis is something wrong with that axis. The axis of the kidney should be with the psoas muscle. The psoas muscle looks, looks like this. So the, the superior pole of the kidney is deeper in the body, more posterior and more medial in the body than the, the lower pole, which is more anterior and more lateral because it's following, it goes from the pelvis, it follows the psoas muscle. So the, this is more this way. So if you have a, the axis, instead of being like this, is like this, horseshoe kidney. Horseshoe kidney, usually the, it's usually like this and not up the upper pole. It's usually the lower pole, and it's, it's usually going to be lower because as it's, as it's going up into the abdomen, it gets caught by the SMA and the IMA, and so it can't go up higher. And it could be a fibrous connection. It could be actual parenchyma, renal parenchyma. When you have, when you have a horseshoe kidney, you're at increased risk of trauma, just like, just like in the pelvic kidney. Stones, infection, and tumors. There's increased risk of Wilms Increased risk. There's increased risk of Wilms tumor. Also, what other kind of patients get horseshoe kidneys? Turner syndrome. Turner syndrome increased risk of getting horseshoe kidneys. And this was a horseshoe kidney. Pelvocaliectasis, that is probably the term that we should use, but we, we always say hydro, mild hydro, moderate hydro, severe hydro. You ask the clinician, and they, they hear the word hydronephrosis, they think obstruction. And we know that we can get hydronephrosis from reflux. You can have primary mega ureter and have hydro, no obstruction. So we really should say pelvocaliectasis, which means the renal pelvis is dilated and the calyces are dilated. Because if we don't know, by just looking at an ultrasound or CT and we see it, we don't know, we probably should call it pelvocaliectasis. Obstruction is a huge one. UPJ stenosis, renal pelvic juncture stenosis. That's when it's at the renal pelvis and you, it, you will get uh, Big, sometimes you get a big extra renal pelvis and then it stops and, uh, because of a UPJ stenosis. 
UVJ stenosis is where we have an obstruction at the ureteral vesicle juncture at the bladder. You can have stones that cause obstruction. You can have slough papilla that causes obstructions. You can have tumors that cause obstructions. You can have a ureter seal that causes an obstruction. In boy, if you have bilateral, if you if you have just a normal OB ultrasound, you really be real careful in the real world if you tell the sex of the baby for no reason. Sometimes women just want to know. That go to the, the some people have ultrasound machines in the mall. If you if it's a medical reason why the, like they have a history of hemophilia and that's going to be a boy, you know, you can really look for a boy. If you see bilateral hydronephrosis and a huge bladder, posterior valves will cause that, so look for a boy. But just be careful because some you could theoretically get sued for saying it's a girl and it ends up being a boy. And you know sometimes that cord could be down there and they might think it's a it's a penis. So just be careful. Just do what, just be careful. Be real careful, especially when most people, the techs are doing the study, and if if you let the patient record the study, and they're, it's recording everything that the ultrasound tech is doing, but you only see a few images, if there's anything wrong with that tech, then it's documented on those images. That patient has the entire thing that you never were privy to. So, be careful when you do something like that because I don't want you guys to get sued when it wasn't your fault. But you know, the tech is a tech miss it. You know that students, you know that a lot of techs, they do all the studies and that they just give you images to look at. You don't get to see, they're in there for 30, 40 minutes. You don't see 30, 40 minutes of images. You see just what they give you. So that's the scary thing about ultrasound. It could be an extrinsic obstruction from a retrocaval ureter, which is an ant mini, or it could be a mass, like I said. It could be non-obstructive, it could be reflux, it could be congenital primary mega ureter, it could be pumbeli, pumbeli. That's for Aya. When she first got here, she, do you know that in the Muslim, the Arabic, there is no P? There's no letter P. So they call it B. So Papa would be Baba. And so when she first told me this, she go, boom, boom, bali. And I said, what did you say? Now she says prune belly. But before, I didn't understand what she was saying, and she th was frustrated because she was saying it. She knew what the diagnosis was, she, but I couldn't understand it because they don't have a, they don't have P. They, so, Baba is Papa. So, prune belly syndrome can have it. Prune belly is when you have absent abdominal wall musculature. You're usually going to have crypt orchidism and a urinary tract obstruction. It's either going to be a functional obstruction because the bladder, your wall, your abdominal wall helps keep tightness and things where they should be. These kids don't have abdominal wall, so their abdomen gets really deformed and stretched out, and they can get a huge bladder, and that big bladder can, get, can kind of fold on itself and go down low and then cause a functional obstruction. And our testicles are made where your ovaries are, and then they go down in the inguinal canal. Well, that big bladder can block it, so they'll have cryptorchidism. And so those are potential causes. Here, this is the Foley catheter with a balloon. But here's a ureter seal, and this is a ureter seal. This is the classic ureter seal. And what's the buzzword that we say for a ureter seal? Cobra. cobra head. This is a cobra head. This is this is like a, almost like an inverted type of uh, ureter seal. But ureter seal, bilateral ureter seals. Here, this is one kidney. This is a little baby, little kid. You can see the upper pole collection system. You see the lower pole collection system. What do you see here? What is this sign called? The drooping lily sign. We The upper pole we don't see. There's no contrast in the upper pole. The lower pole is like this. So it's a drooping lily. And look at the bladder, the urinary bladder. We have this huge filling defect in here. So we have the Weigert-Meyer rule of uh, first year. Uh, uh, do you know what, uh, uh, Br Brad, do you know what the Weigert-Meyer rule is? Um, if you don't, that's okay. Yes. It's not age. This is important. Do you know what it is, Bob? Okay, Laura. Laura, do you know the Weigert-Meyer rule? Okay, second year. John Boy. Um, it's when you have a duplicated collective. Yes, sir. And the upper, the upper moiety obstructs. Absolutely. And the lower refluxes. Absolutely. And so, what's the important thing about this? The upper pole obstructs. The lower pole refluxes. But there's two ureters. Where does the upper pole ureter go? It inserts lower. Inserts more inferior and medial, and often with a ureter seal. That's why it obstructs. The lower pole refluxes. Where does that lower pole ureter insert? More superior and lateral. Right where it should. Oh, right. The lower pole inserts normally. But, but it, 
But the upper pole, upper pole inserts inferior medial to normal, so it's an ectopic insertion, and it has a ureter seal. That ureter is coursing through the bladder wall, and what they think is it goes right past the normal UVJ where the lower pole is inserting, but it thins out the wall, which allows for reflux. And that's why you have a drooping lily, because this will get contrast in it. This one's obstructed, so you don't see any contrast. It's pushing it down because it's obstructed. That's the Weigermeyer rule. That's very good, John. That's exactly what's, it. What's more common, intrinsic or extrinsic uh, ureter seal? I can't remember. The in, inside the bladder is more, more common. Upper obstructs lower refluxes. Why, it, drooping lily. If you remember drooping lily, that means we see. Look, look at this. Look at this. We see this part. We don't see that part. So if we see this part, it's not obstructed. The, we don't see anything in the upper because it's totally obstructed. A totally obstructed kidney is not going to excrete anything because it's totally obstructed. And on that, they would go. The urologist would do a cystoscopy and would cut that, cut that big ureter seal, and they, they, they hopefully that kidney would start working. They'd have to do a nuclear medicine study to see how much function is coming from that upper pole. Here is a posterior valve. This is the ultrasound. The right kidney you see hygienophrosis. Left kidney you see hygienophrosis. On the transverse images of the urinary bladder, that's the best view to see the, the dilated distal ureters. Here's the right ureter, the left ureter. They're both dilated. The bladder's big. And if you look here, this is the, the head is that direction, the feet are that direction, the back is here, belly's here. This is the posterior urethra. It's the keyhole. We actually see the urethra. So on this, you would do a VCUG. You do a VCUG to prove there's a posterior urethra. And here's the VCUG. We have a trabeculated small bladder because over time, this thing has tried its best to force the urine out because this is the posterior urethra, which is the prostatic urethra. And there is a sharp transition between normal or small and this dilated. And that is the, where the posterior urethral valve is. The most common type of posterior urethral valve is when it goes from the back wall and goes distal. Is it like a lot, just like a valve that does this. That's the most common by far. Least common is when it comes and goes proximal, goes back towards the bladder, and the, the rarest is the diaphragm with a little hole in it. That's the rarest of the types. The most common is when it's coming here and the valve goes more distal. So urologist goes in there, goes in and, and through the penis and will will lice that valve. But this is the prostatic urethra. If you see a filling defect, that would be the vera montanum, which I'm going to show you in this. This is another posterior urethral valve. This is, this is not bladder. This is the posterior urethra. And the way you know it is, you know what this is called right here, Luis? That's the prostatic utricle. The vera montanum is this filling defect. You see a little whitish, grayish area in the middle of the black peripherally? That's the vera montanum. The important thing, that's where the ejaculatory ducts insert. So here we have the bladder. This is the vera montanum. That's where the ejaculatory ducts enter. This is a prostatic uh, utricle. They used, to, they used to think it's a mullerian duct. Now I think there's some controversy if it is a mullerian duct remnant. Mullerian ducts are in women. Wolfian ducts are in men. Uh, here's the posterior valve. This is the membranous urethra. That's within the UG diaphragm. This is the bulbous urethra. And the out part is the penile urethra. Girls do not get posterior urethral valves. Girls do not get posterior urethral valves. Boys do, can. Girls don't. This is an Aunt Minnie. Carson, do you know what this is? Well, you can just tell me what you see. Yeah, Hydronephrosis. You have a yeah. huge renal pelvis, marked clubbing in of the calices, and the ureter. What right. about the ureter? It is displaced for some reason, coursing posterior medial is going medial to the L4 pedicle. So medial to the, the ureter is medial to the L4 pedicle. The right side is normal. If they were both that way, you could worry about uh, retroperitoneal fibrosis. This is an ant mini. If you've never seen it, I've now you've seen it. seen it. It's a retrocaval ureter. This is a retro. I've seen it on IVP. So look at this. This is a right. retrocaval ureter. It goes, the ureter goes medial to the L4 pedicle. It's persistence of the right posterior cardinal vein, ventral to the ureter, and failure of development of right supercardinal system. So just, you get this obstruction, and the ureter is going medial to the L4 pedicle. That's classic. If they're both going medial, it could be retroperitoneal fibrosis. But if, it's, if the other one's normal and this is going medial, it's, it's uh, retrocable ureter. This is avoiding cystoyurethram. 
This is showing you massive reflux, grade five reflux on this left side. The ureter is tremendously dilated. No reflux is normal. It, sh it should be a one-way one street. The kidney makes the urine, goes down the ure ureter, goes into the bladder, goes through the urethra. There's no two-way valve, two-way uh, street. This is reflux. The bad thing about reflux is if you have a bladder infection, you get a fever, it's uncomfortable, it burns, but you're not scarring your kidneys. If you get pyelonephritis, you could scar your kidneys. If you reflux, now you're, you increase risk of refluxing infected urine into your kidneys, so it increases the risk of getting pyelonephritis. And this was severe. This is the highest grade of reflux you can get, grade five. Here, this is one image. The abdomen looks very bizarre, correct? And does it change by just changing patient position? Yes. Anyone have any idea what this is? This is the bladder. I think I will make me want to Yep. Prumbly. Prumbly. <laughs> Aya, she's very, very smart. She knew this was prune belly or Eagle Barrett syndrome. This is absent abdominal musculature. <laughs> and it's prune belly. It's also called Eagle Barrett syndrome. It's congenital, it's not hereditary. It's almost exclusively in males. I told you to try it. Absent abdominal wall musculature, urinary tract obstruction, and crypt orchidism. And I think I told you all about that already. This is a very rare thing. It's called megacalicosis. You have increased number of calices, and they're all massively dilated. But look, the renal, pelvis, and ureter are not. So what you see what I'm saying, what could cause all of the calices? There's nothing. TB causes infundibular strictures, but I don't think it's going to affect every single infundibulum on both sides. So the calices are way too big, out of proportion, for the infundibulum and for the renal pelvis and ureter. So this is called megacalicosis. Uh, it's enlargement of this with increased number, and it's not associated with reflux. So just know that there's a condition called megacalicosis. It's non-obstructed dilatation. Renal mass is in a newborn. I told you, number one is hydro, two, multi dysplastic kidney. Uh, number three, uh, in a unilateral renal mass, it could be mesoblastic nephroma. Uh, if it's a, the most common cause in a, of a solid, solid renal mass is mesoblastic nephroma. The, the, these other two are cystic. This is hydro, so it's an obstruction. This is multi dysplastic kidney. They believe that's due to either an atresia of the, renal, uh, of the renal pelvis or the ureter. And so you get massive hydronephrosis that gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, and then it just pinches off, and you have all these cysts that do not communicate in a non-functioning kidney. If they're bilateral, hydronephrosis is still number one. Polycystic kidney disease is number two. Multicystic kidney disease uh, it could be bilateral or unilateral with hydronephrosis of the contralateral kidney. Nephroblastomatosis, which is multiple masses which is a precursor to Wilms tumor. Nephroblastomatosis is the, is the second most common cause of this, most common cause of, a, of multiple solid masses in the kidney and the newborn. Uh, precursor to Wilms. A single renal mass in an older kid is Wilms. You can get multilocular cystic nephroma, which is a benign tumor, but has a malignant potential. The thing about this is that they can have well-circumscribed thick capsule. It's usually unifocal, non-communicating, with various size septated cystic mass, usually in the lower pole of the kidney. So a multilocular cystic nephroma is usually in the lower pole of the kidney, it's encapsulated, septated, thick-walled. Focal hydro is a possibility. A post-traumatic cyst or abscess is. Renal cell, the older the kid, after eight years of age, it would not be Wilms tumor anymore. It would be renal cell, especially if they had von Hippel-Lindau syndrome. Uh, teratoma, you can get that. You can get uh, neuro, intrarenal neuroblastoma, but that's really, really rare. Other masses, uh, multiple masses in an old kid, nephroblastomatosis, which is the most common cause of multiple masses in an infant. Could be Wilms tumor. Wilms can be multiple. Angiomyolipoma. When you see fat in it, you think uh, if there's, there's two types of people that get angiomyolipomas. Young women, they get one huge one, and they'll present with hematuria. And then the one that have a bunch of them are the tuberous sclerosis patients. The tuberous sclerosis patients, the triad tuberous sclerosis, don't be offended, but it's zits, fits, nitwits. Zits are adenosubation, shade green patches. Fits are seizures, nitwits is mental retardation. That's tuberous sclerosis. But they have angiomyolipomas. They also get rhabdomyomas in their heart. Tuberous sclerosis patients get rhabdomyomas, not rhabdomyosarcomas. 
Uh, leukemia lymphoma can cause multiple masses. Uh, adult polycystic kidney disease causes multiple cysts. Abscesses can do this. Here's a patient that has these cysts. It's very important that you go in there and look to make sure they're not communicating, because if these are communicating, that's hydronephrosis. If they're not communicating, like in this case, this multi-cystic plastic kidney, and this kidney is non-functioning, and this kidney will usually just kind of auto-infarct on itself and shrink down to nothing. The problem is there's a high incidence, you have to check the other kidney, because the other kidney might have a UPJ obstruction, stenosis. It might reflux on the other side, but it might also have a multi-cystic dysplastic kidney. And if you have bilateral multi-dysplastic kidneys, those babies die. They don't make urine because neither kidney works. So in utero, they had oligo hydramnios, and when they're born, they'll usually live one to two days and they die because they, they don't make urine. These kidneys don't work. But it's important if they communicate for hydronephrosis because urology can go in there and put a stent and try to save whatever renal cortex there is from, the, from becoming uh, non-functioning. These multi-cystic plastic kidneys have multiple non-communicating cysts of various sizes. They think it's probably due to ureter or UPJ atresia, an increased risk of other side I told you reflux and UPJ stenosis. Two-thirds of these are going to involute on their own, so you don't have to take them out. When you would have to take it out is if you got infected. These can have a hypertension. These patients can have hypertension. This is a very rare type of multi-cystic plastic kidney. It's called the hydronephrotic obstructive type because here there's not multiple cysts. You just look like a giant renal pelvis in these two infundibula. But this was, uh, it's either severe congenital hydro versus multi-cystic plastic kidney. And if this was severe congenital hydro, that kidney's not gonna be working anyway. You see the cortex is super thin. The, on an ultrasound, on a newborn, their renal cortex will be more echogenic than the liver. In a newborn, it's normal to be more echogenic than the liver. After a couple of months, and especially in a year and older, it should be this, from that point on, the kidney echogenicity should be about the same or a little darker than the liver. Here, they, this patient had a CT or some IV study, uh, IV contrast study, and look at the kidneys. They're huge. This is a little baby. It's, a new, it's, a, it's an infant. Huge kidneys. If you do an ultrasound, the OB ultrasound might have said enlarged echogenic kidneys. It didn't say anything about cysts. So this is in autosomal recessive, infantile polycystic kidney disease. These cysts are two millimeters, one to two millimeters, and there are thousands of them. And all those little shadows, those little are the little wall surfaces are what causes the echogenic area. They're not big cysts like we have in adult polycystic kidney disease or autosomal dominant. They're tiny microcysts, one to two millimeters. And they're going to give you big, big kidneys, and they're going to be echogenic on ultrasound. You will not see cysts. And this is the one that these little babies, that when they die, they're either going to die of liver disease or kidney disease. If the liver disease is real bad, the kidney disease is minimal. If the kidney disease is real bad, the liver disease is minimal. So as opposed to adult polycystic kidney disease, which is something totally different. This is autosomal recessive. So they'll call this autosomal recessive polycystic kidney disease, which is the infantile type. The antenatal is the most common, 90% with cystic changes of the renal tubules. Patient dies from renal failure and pulmonary hypoplasia. They'll have oligohydramnios, and they can die within 24 hours, three-fourths of them, or within a year. These are uniformly fatal. Type 2 is neonatal type, which is renal tubulation 60%, and now you're starting to get mild hepatic fibrosis. The patient will die of renal failure or hypertension within the first year of life, usually. The infantile type with the renal tubular octage is only 20% now, and you're getting mild to moderate periportal hepatic fibrosis. This usually develops when the kid's three to six months of age, and they're gonna, they're gonna die of chronic renal failure, hypertension, portal hypertension. And then the juvenile type is when you barely have any kidney problem, but you have severe hepatic fibrosis and proliferation of the bile ducts. And this disease develops between one and five years of age, and they're gonna die from portal hypertension. So the, the most common type, they're going to die of renal failure and lung, the lungs aren't mature, and that's the most common. And then this is very little renal problems, but a lot of hepatic fibrosis. Here, if you did this, it was in the, the Hounsville's in the minus, like maybe minus 100, minus 80, minus 60. So this is, this is fat. You do a CT. These are sub calcified mm -hmm. subependable tubers. Uh, this is tuber sclerosis. What happens, Luis? 
there's a tuber that can be right here in the anterior part of the third ventricle, right near the frame of Monroe, that can degenerate into a specific type of cancer. What's the name of the cancer, do you know? It's in tuber sclerosis. When you do a CT or an MR, you need to look. This is the, usually the spot that it's gonna degenerate into this thing. It's called a giant cell astrocytoma. They degenerate into a giant cell astrocytoma. And it's usually the one in the anterior part of the third ventricle near the frame of Monroe. But these calcifications and, and, and the history, just classic tuber sclerosis. Here, these are multiple hepatic cysts. Here's the kidneys, multiple renal cysts. There's a cyst in the pancreas. This is autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease. Uh, they get cysts everywhere. You can get them in your ovaries, in your testicles, in everywhere, all the organs. What's a key thing about this, Daniel, that we have to tell the clinicians to look for? CTA, they have for baryaneurysm. Thir up to 30% of these will get the baryaneurysm of the circle of Willis. And so they need, that can kill them earlier than what they're gonna die. These patients are gonna get renal failure later on. If they live long, they will get renal failure. But they, if they have an aneurysm, it bursts when they're in their teens or 20s, they, they could die. Cysts everywhere, liver more than pancreas, you can have cysts in the spleen, epididymis, testes, ovaries, lungs, thyroid. Up to 30% bury aneurysms. You have to mention that in your report. That's something that you need to know because if the clinician doesn't know, they need a CTA or an MRA of the circle of Willis. They're going to get high blood hypertension most likely, and they're going to get renal failure. Are they going to have liver failure? Well, can they get liver failure? Not from that. So, but li renal failure, yes. Here is another post-contrast injection. Do you see this calyx and this little round ball? It looks like it's on a golf tee. This is where the papilla is. This is papillary necrosis. Papillary necrosis has got a great mnemonic for you to remember, and a lot of these are good ones, and it's called postcard. These are causes for papillary necrosis. P is polynephritis, not uncommon. O is obstruction, definitely not uncommon. S is sickle cell disease. We have tons of sickle cell disease patients here. T is TB, not so common. In the world it's common, but not here. C is cirrhosis, alcoholism, it could be Christmas disease. A is a great one, analgesic abuse. Analgesic abuse will give you uh, papillary necrosis. R is renal vein thrombosis, which could happen with dehydration. D is dehydration and diabetes. So there's a lot of good ones in here, causes of papillary necrosis. You should definitely know this mnemonic residence. You should definitely know the causes because it's important. Papillary necrosis. Here, we did this, this was several years ago. This is the dilated renal pelvis and lower pole collecting system. What does this look like? If you saw this anywhere else, you'd call it what? Gas, that's air. This is emphysematous polynephritis. This is not good. There was no instrumentation. Urology did not put a double J or do a retrograde on that side. So this is a gas-producing organism, usually E. coli producing this. Bladder wall masses, congenital would be ureteroceles, a uracal cyst, uh, tumors, rhabdomyosarcoma is the most common bladder mass in a young child is rhabdomyosarcoma. When they're a teenager and adult is transitional cell. But in the young child, the infant, if you see a bladder mass, it'll look maybe a bunch of grapes, rhabdomyosarcoma. It, inflammation, you can get cystitis, you can get thickened bladder wall, it can, it can look really weird. Schistosomiasis, the bladder wall calcifications. In the world, schistosomiasis is the number one cause of bladder wall calcifications uh, in the world. And if you're from Egypt and you have schist, it's because it's endemic in Egypt, and if you have it and you say you don't, you're in denial. That's a, a great joke. For my comedians that stand up, my stand up comedians, they can use that. Uh, you're in <laughs> denial. If you ever do, I've been to Egypt. If you ever go to Egypt, you stay on the east side of the Nile River because if you go on the west side, you can get the West Nile virus. The east, I don't know why the, the mosquitoes stop because they go, this is the east side. I can't go on the east side. I've got to stay over here. And of course, that's a joke also. <laughs> TB will cause bladder wall calcifications with a very contracted urinary <laughs> bladder. Trauma can get a hematoma. I already showed you this one, a big ureter seal, cobra head ureter seal. Here, if you look right up in here in the anterior abdominal wall, you have this cyst, this enhancing wall. This is going from the belly button to the dome of the bladder. And that is a uracal cyst. There are different types of uracal abnormalities. A patent urachus will be leaking urine from the belly button. 
it's a connection between the dome of the bladder, it's always the dome of the bladder and the umbilicus, the belly button, and a patent uracus is open on both ends. A uracal cyst is closed on both ends. A uracal sinus is closed on the bladder end, but open on the belly button end, so they can get a little bit of leaking. A uracal diverticulum is closed on the belly button end and open on the bladder end. So these can get infected, they can get it turned into a cancer. So if you have an adult and they have a, bl a bladder dome tumor, it could be an adenocarcinoma. And if it's an adenocarcinoma, that is a uracal carcinoma because adults get transitional cell. At the dome of the bladder, though, a uracal carcinoma will be an adenocarcinoma. And this was the ultrasound. It actually, you could see this track going all the way to the bladder dome, all the way to the belly button. So I told you about uracal cyst, both ends closed, uracal sinus, patent only the umbilicus, diverticulum is only open at the bladder dome, and a patent uracus is open both ends. Here is a diverticulum. Here's the urinary bladder, here's the dome, and there's this little outpouching right here. It's not a, it's, it's, it's a, a uracal diverticulum. If it's over here, it just, we call it a hutch diverticulum. If it's at the UVJ, this is a uracal diverticulum. Here is a, an old in-service question. Uh, you were shown a T1 and post-contrast fat sat coronal images from an MR exam in a three-year-old boy with urinary retention. What is the most likely diagnosis? Here we have the urinary bladder. Here we have a fungating, kind of lobulated fungating mass that's involving the bladder. It's not metastatic Wilms tumor. It's not a germ cell tumor. It's not hemorrhagic cystitis. Rhabdomyosarcoma sarcoma is the most common bladder mass in a young child. These are diverticula, and this filling defect in it is a huge stone. When you have diverticula, you're increased risk of getting stasis and stones and other infections, and in chronic infections can lead to squamous cell. So this is my, I'll stop at this one since it's one o'clock. This is a classic, it's a teenager or a young adult woman that's never had a period. Classic is hirsutism, obesity, uh, well, no menstrual period, and you can have acne and they can, then they can start losing hair. Uh, this is polycystic ovarian syndrome. This is the transabdominal sun. This is the bladder, it's very full. And you look at this ovary in children and teenagers and young 20 year old, the ovaries aren't gonna be big yet. These aren't huge cysts. These are tiny follicles that, num that number like 21 or more and they're all around the periphery of the ovaries. The best study you need is an endovaginal ultrasound. A lot of times the tech will say, are you sexually active? And they'll say no, so they'll say, okay, no, no, no transvaginal. They don't even offer it to the, to, the, to the teenager or the woman. They need to have it because if they, if they meet this, what the classic finding is, like me, we're obese, the ovaries look normal. You don't see a ton of little follicles around here. This would be called normal. But when you do the endovaginal ultrasound, you see all of these little black follicles all around the periphery of both ovaries. There, it used to be you had to have more than 11, and they said maybe more than 16. It's more than like 21 or so. You're gonna, it should be no problem. There's a ton of them. They're all about the same size, little tiny follicles all around the periphery, like the old rotary dial phone, and that's polycystic ovarian syndrome. And if you have a hard job remembering that, remember me. I think I have it because I'm <laughs> fat, I'm, I'm hairy, I'm alopecia, I used to have acne, I've never had a period. And so, uh, <laughs> the only thing, I don't have a uterus and an ovary, but if I did, I'd probably have polycystic ovarian syndrome, and that's how you can remember it. And I will, for us, for the rest of us, I'll finish next time after this. Uh, let me just finish this. Polycystic ovarian syndrome It's also called Stein-Leventhal syndrome. 2.5% of women have it, and many women that have it do not have the symptoms that I just told you. Androgen excess from deficient aromatase activity converts androgens into estrogen. The late second decade is classic, so this is what I told you about. Uh, enlarged ovaries, but the majority, especially if they're young, will have normal sized ovaries. And they're gonna, it's more than 11. It's like nowadays, it's more than 21 or something. So it, it, it goes up. You should have no problems having more. And that's it. I'll stop there. Again, thank you to the people that are interviewing with us. I hope you enjoyed your stay. I hope you really consider us. Uh, we won't call you guys in January and February. I've told most of you that, that we don't call you because it could be a match violation. You can email us, you can text us, you can call us, but we, you, Dr. Simoncini and Elizabeth, we will not call you. We'll answer your questions, but we're not going to call you. You might be number one on our list and we won't call you. So please don't think, oh, they don't like me because they didn't call me. That's not the truth. And 
I wish you the very best. I hope each and every one of you match in radiology. I hope you get where you want to get. And I hope you all become the best radiologist you can. You picked the best field in medicine. You really did. Thank you.